Yeah. I'm excited. <laughs> Welcome everyone. My name is Jaime Ortega. I'm the director of OutFilm Connecticut, actually the co-director um, for this year's LGBTQ Film Festival. And I'm here with Shadra Pittman. I'm here with Dr. Abed and Eugene um, for uh, the <laughs> um, BIPOC Shorts uh, Q&A session. So welcome everyone. Um, and so let's get right to it. Um, let's talk about uh, Free to Be. Um, so I, I just rewatched this again today, and um, I really felt that this was a really deeply personal film for you, and it's really about the LGBTQ experience and people's journeys and coming out. Um, how did you decide to do the interview, and how did you find them? So ideally, I actually have a connection with every single one of the talents before you know we even started this process. Um, I went to a performing arts high school growing up in Dallas, Texas, which you know is um, more of the conserva uh, conservative city. Um, but I grew up pretty liberal, at least on my mother's side. My dad's a little more conservative. But La Ganja, also Jay Jackson, went to high school with me. Um, and so the first time that I, I used to wear hot pink lipstick like every day in high school. <laughs> And it was just a place where we were able to fully express ourselves. It started at a very young age. And so in our transition of life, I went to school in New York, uh, Laganja was in LA and before um, she went to RuPaul's Drag Race, I was bedazzling, I went to school for costume design, I was bedazzling little garments um, for her before she went to RuPaul's Drag Race. And it was just, um, a notion of like, this is the community that has fully, fully accepted me in every aspect of my life and every um, trial that I've been through, especially out here in Los Angeles, and has pretty much saved me in, in several different instances. And I met um, Dabrian, who I actually found out was my cousin while we were shooting this, um, you know, just hanging out and he is best friends with one of my best friends and he brought me to a ball one time and I was just like I feel at home you know and I had always heard of it but I had never ever experienced it and I knew Laganja had came from such a you know strong dance background going to Cal Arts and and high school and it was interesting how there were so many different variables that have been you know, played in the, in the, I guess, you know, pop culture community and with dance. And I feel like sometimes they're not really recognized. Mm -hmm. um, and so Laganja had so much success and Dabrian was like, you know, I'm, I'm still, you know, a father to the house of Balenciaga, but people really still don't know like what that means. And it's like, well, this is a community within another community. And we really, these are individuals and people that have really been, you know, kicked out of their homes and disowned. And now you're taking on this like mother, father, brother, sister parenting aspect. And I just found it so interesting, especially because, you know, a few years back I was on set and I met Gracie Cartier before Gracie Cartier was Kareem as a hair and makeup stylist to the stars. And I was uh, assisting this director at the time and she was just amazing. And then a few later, a few years later, and just recently came out as being HIV positive, as mm -hmm. well as saying, you know, I have gone through this transition. I am a voice, and I am okay finally being myself. And Ash, I met through Laganja because in 2019, at the beginning of 2019, I actually called 911 and for help and actually went to jail for five days and it wasn't my fault. And so Ash is a phenomenal photographer and really just kind of said, hey, I think that trans people deserve to be on the cover of magazines as well. And so he started that transition while also going through his own transition um, as being trans man. And we really just sat and had a really wonderful conversation. And she had did, um, he had did a piece for me that right before uh, he transitioned that was just so powerful about, you know, 
being imprisoned and being a black woman in prison, um, a photography series. And this is right before, actually during the process of his transition. So all of these people have had a, a major impact to not only where I consider my friends, my family. And yeah. I think it's important that we can only create change when we step, you know, we step outside of ourselves. And I'm like, uh, originally I had auditioned for a piece that the person was non-binary and the manager that I was auditioning for, cause I, I was an actor first, was like, why would you ever want to play a character that is non-binary? And I was just in shock. And then the manager was like, I apologize, but is this something that you identify with? And I was like, these, like, I don't like, these are the stories of real people. These are the stories of people that you want to understand. So that way we as a world and a society can have a better understanding. And it was going to be scripted at first, um, and I was going to do it with Laganja, and I was going to play this character that was non-binary. But then I was like, you know what? I have to step out of this because in 2019, I lost some friends that uh, were in the trans community in Dallas, Texas. And I said, you know, we need to get to the root of this. And we don't have a crazy budget, but we just kind of need to, you know, shake some shit up, excuse my language, and, and really... You know, a lot of, uh, we had a very small crew and two of the camera uh, guys were like, I, I, I've I never been exposed to this world in my life. And thank you for sharing this because uh, Dabrian is very well known in the skateboarding community. And he was like, I didn't even know somebody that was a skateboarder could even live this other life and be in Paul. And I'm like, these are people, we have to have this conversation. So that is, kind of where it all stemmed from. And I saw, um, you know, as we were marching for George Floyd and I saw um, uh, this trans woman get attacked by her own community in the black community. And I'm like, this is not just a black and white thing. This is a world thing. And this, we need to have a conversation. Yeah, absolutely. Can you um, describe in like a couple of sentences for Dr. Abbott and Shadro, uh, your film, Free TV? So we kind of, you know, we kind of tackle two things and we go through the eyes of four individuals that identify with the LGBTQIA community that are pushing uh, their voice for social justice and equality, you know, while also kind of piggybacking off of the Black LGBT community that's kind of been forgotten in the kind of pop culture space and that's kind of shaped so many of the iconic people that we see today. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, and um, one of the interviewees, um, I can't remember um, their name, but he talks about representation in the mainstream media, and he poses a question, um, would people watch something that, that they don't know of, that they don't know about? And he's, and he's you know, popular shows like Pose um, and Legendary, and that are, you know, sort of, they're really in the mainstream now. Um, what's your take on popular media and queer representation? And what's your opinion on recent media attempts to capture the ballroom scene? I think, um, you know, to be, to be very honest, I think, I still think the producers of Legendary are still by uh, white heterosexual men. Um, and that is kind of misleading because at the same time you're starting to give us a voice, but we're not leading that voice. Um, you know, especially for someone like Adrian that has served in the military and then has been in the ballroom community for a major house, high school in Tiaga, you know, some of them are starting to get, you know, uh, exposure, which is good, but it's only at a limit, you know? Mm -hmm. There are a lot of stories where there are the leads are blacks, but the they ha they're starting to put people in the writer's room, which is beautiful. But if we can have, you know, just a little bit more black directors, black creators saying, I'm going to do this and I don't have to have, you know, just, you know, a Caucasian male saying that this is OK, you know, but yeah. I think we're we're. Ideally, it's it's again. I think change happens when our fellow brothers and sisters open the door and say, "You know what? I'm gonna actually let this person take the reins and tell the story and give them the budget that they deserve because they know it best." Yeah, 
Yeah, and it's interesting how, you know, Pose was brought up and even just, it, it's a show that I watch, um, thinking about how that show started with um, the main characters, there was at least two or three of them that were white. And into the second season, they were written off the show, like they were gone. So, but it was like, it kind of needed them to introduce the show to a wider audience. Mm -hmm. um, so I thought that was interesting compared to like where the show is now. And then I think about the show's ending, what, what else is there gonna be? Is there gonna be something else? And that worries me in a sense, um, because uh, you know I, I, I believe representation matters and we need to see ourselves and our stories on in film and on the TV and all that. Um, so yeah. So what are your what are your thoughts on you know shows like Pose ending? And are you hopeful that that we will be given opportunities to put to put ourselves on screen? You know, Pose is so interesting to me. I, I think it's done really well. I think it's, it's the costumes are fabulous. I think the story is great. I just I just know the root of Pose comes from Paris is Burning, you know, yeah. and, and uh, you know, the root of where Paris is Burning, you know, those characters felt, a lot of those characters died shortly after where they got no props and they were ostracized for, you know, for being in Paris is burning. So for it to be so successful, again, it's kind of like this piggyback that kind of history kind of repeats itself because they basically was like, they were like, this woman came into our lives. She exposed us and put a lot of us in danger. But then we have Paris is burning, which is wonderful. It still exposes people, but it's like, you know, what's next? Because now we have created something and it's like, well, I, I'm right. I'm writing, um, a show right now that I'm that's very very dear to me but I again we have a way of thinking like oh being a part of this community is only being fabulous and only being this and only being that when there's so much more to it and, you know I, I love the aspect that Pose brings a family and starts to open up a world that you know we would have never seen if we didn't get that opportunity of telling that story Pose I'm just hoping that moving forward, we give that opportunity to other creators like ourselves and open the doors to have something very mainstream, you know, right. you know, Stonewall again, the statues of Stonewall are two Caucasian men sitting there holding hands. And it's like, that's not what it looks like at all. And yeah. it's like, give us that opportunity because they become mesmerized, but then it's like, they don't want to get too close. So we just hope moving forward that if you are willing to get close and you are willing to rub shoulders with this community and you know say we want to create these stories that we really, really, really do allow the people in the forefront that have worked hard and been in the business for years to yeah. be you know at that forefront and push that button. And I re I really, really do hope it opens doors because it can really change um, you know so much of just everyone's eyes to say, can we, we actually can hold hands, you know, again, at some aspect, hopefully. Yeah. yeah. Your documentary covers a lot in a short amount of time. Um, you know, it covers the early queer rights movement, ballroom culture, Stonewall. Um, it talks, it connects all of that with um, Black Lives Matter. Um, it talks about the importance of representation. And what I like especially too, is that it acknowledges white privilege. Um, can you talk about a little bit about the process in making this film and how you were able to fit all of these um, topics so succinctly? Um, and if you do have plans to make a long full length version? Well, we de we definitely are hoping to have an opportunity to have plans to, you know, dive in to more of these characters. And actually, you know, a lot of when we, all of the characters, some of the characters, Look Angela and Debrian had an opportunity to meet for the first time and it was really really beautiful and and we're like you know can we like film this open in like conversation like we're doing here um and i think you know there was so there was so much going on at that time that i kind of wanted to just i i sent over you know the questions a little bit of the questions beforehand i had a deep conversation with everyone and i was like listen whatever you're willing to share i i think it will open up an opportunity for other people to sit at the table and 
you know, we can share a seat at the table and have this conversation. I, I did have a lot going on because I pretty much filmed about maybe at least almost two hours for each person. And I was like, you know what? We don't have the budget. So let's see how we are able to just give a little taste of, of a little bit of what we, what, what we can potentially dive into. Um, and I, I, I ideally would love to make it as a docu-series because I think that, you know, there's still so much of a struggle with each individual. Um, uh, Ash literally just finished his surgery two weeks ago. And, you know, it's it's something really, really beautiful. And I was I was very concerned and worried because I was like, Ash, you disappeared. Where are you? This is my friend, this is my family. And 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 he was just like, you know, I, I just went through it. And, you know, I, I wish I can share my story and have a um, you know, other people to understand that it's okay exactly what I'm going through and this is normal. And so I, I definitely, I definitely hope that we have the opportunity. We are pitching it to a couple of people. We're trying to and get some other representation out there. Um, it was, I can say as far as like the mix up, I knew the, the ending goal, you know, I wanted us to make a piece that say like, you know, when you're marching for Black Lives Matter because there has been some people in the trans community that were killed by police brutality, but we just don't hear about it. Um, yeah. I wanted us to say, you know, when we're marching together, we're marching together, you know, whether you're black, you're white, whatever, when we're marching, this is this is something that we come together and do. You know, it's whether you identify as trans, non-binary, LG, any, aspect any spectrum male female it's it's even harder if you identify you know as black so putting those layers on top of each other and so many like why do we have to identify as something instead of just being human being and my presence and soul is who i am then like at the end of the day what can we say for each other and how can we say hey guys we've been a part of this We've been fighting for LGBTQIA rights when no one was fighting for us at the end of the day. We're, we've been here, we, we are we're going to continue to fight for every human, humane rights, but let's just kind of shine a voice. And within that voice, let's have a come to Jesus moment or universe moment and say, you know what? I've never been to a protest I and, and they're peaceful and, some of them can be violent, but some of them, I'm like, it, it's for a bigger cause. And if you can, I think we all have to take off our judgment hats at the end of the day. And I just wanted to kind of give that message. Yeah. Well, thank you. And um, good luck with, with you know, um, making it into something, a docu-series, I think you mentioned. So, all right. So let's switch over to the passionate pursuit of Angela Bowen. Um, so, um, I, like I said, I just re I rewatched this again just to get ready. And so my understanding is that there's a longer version of this documentary, Dr. Abbott, um, and as well as a shorter version, the one that we're showing. Um, can you tell a bit about what drew you to this subject and what your journey has been with it? Um, I know that it aired on PBS as part of the To the Contrary. Um, can you tell us about how that came about? Sure. First of all, um, this, um, I'm really glad to be here and be in Connecticut. Um, the Passion Pursuits of Angela Bowen um, is about um, a, a woman who, <laughs> who is larger than life in many ways, but basically in terms of Connecticut means a lot because she brought art, black art and culture into New Haven that was a um, absent of it. In, in 1963, at the beginning of the civil rights movement, she saw dance and culture for communities and children uh, as her civil rights work uh, in 1963, and she did that for 19 years. Um, um, so, um, and 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 became the cultural known as the cultural maven of New Haven, which Shaver will talk a little bit about that. But um, the journey from PBS, from, from the feature documentary to the PBS, it's, it, it's a short one, really. Um, I, um, you know, I, 
I didn't even know what I was applying for. At some point, you start just applying for things. And all of a sudden, I get it, something back saying, you won this award, you know, so your film can be on PBS. I said, oh, that's really great. And she said, yeah, but you have to change it from a feature to 20 minutes. Mm. Now, it took me 10 years to do a feature film. <laughs> And, um, you know, because uh, you don't have money and you have to raise kids and get degrees and all kinds of things, you have to live your life and cart, you know, tapes that get that get progressively smaller from one state to another. <laughs> um, so that's what the progress was, which is that I had to actually re-raise money in order to do the cut because to, to, to do the cut, it was a different, it's a different headset and a, and a different set of things that you need to be doing. Um, and uh, so that was that was that was the journey of it. I, I I just applied for something and and I won it. You know, I mean that that's what you do. You know, you, you sometimes you just have that's what you do. <laughs> I imagine that would have been really challenging to to go from a feature to a short. <laughs> well, it what it does, you know, and Angela has, has had a very big life. You know, this was not a just a this is not a story about the dance school. This is a story about a woman who began her life in being born in 1936 in Roxbury, Massachusetts, um, and, you know, a, a, a poor black family. Um, and I wanted to know how the hell did she become who she was and how did she grow to be who she was and to be able to have a sense of herself and a sense of her own mind. How did she do that? Um, so I, I wanted to, to it's, it's an important story. And when I met her in 1979, I only knew her as a feminist. And then I had discovered all this stuff about the school and we had been together 20 years before I asked her, cause I had already done, I was a broadcaster, radio broadcaster in Connecticut, as a matter of fact, on WELI, the Jennifer Abbott show. And so when I changed into film, I did a film on Audre Lorde, um, and you know the the um, you know about the very historical I Am Your Sister conference before two years before she died. She saw that film, <laughs> so and she's in that film, and she saw that I could do film. Uh, so um, I and I as as her partner, as her lover, as her you know person who adored her, um, I wanted to know more about how she got to be who she was, and felt as though that that was important to me because I didn't know this whole history. I met her when she was 42. You know, I, I was 32 at the time. So she had a life beforehand. And that's why I wanted to do, to do the film. And I have a feeling that was not your question, but that's what I meant. <laughs> He's, it's larger than life, um, you know. Yes. And I'm curious, I, you know, touched a little bit about, um, you know, the school and that just being one component. Of her life, um, what are, what were some of the challenges that the Bowen Peters School had gone through, and does the school exist today, or if it does, what form? The the school began in 1963, and um, they had 300 dollars that they started the school with. They 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 uh, Penn, her husband, uh, they got married in in Boston. They had a little baby that they brought to New Haven because they were looking around, and um, so. Ken went door to door in the projects and tried to let them know about the school. They opened up in the, at a, a storefront in the middle of the black community, um, uh, in the heart of the black community, and so and thus and thus it began. And they, I think, they started out with fourteen students or something like that. And you know, over the nineteen year period of nineteen years, they just they become a cultural uh, institution. Um, and and like I said, the community because there were so many, the, the students came. That meant that the parents came, and they made it into a community event. They had to do the, they did, you know, they did those wonderful, um, um, you know, performances once a year, the, the recitals. And they had to do. They had, the women made the costumes, and the men, you know, you know, did the. the it was it. It became an institution. So the, by, by the time she she left, the influence was enormous. There were people who who were trained, who didn't think they could dance, but she also wanted them to know who they were as human beings. So what grew from that school were people who, who didn't think much of themselves, who had become judges in Connecticut. Uh, people who are working with Alvin Ailey and teaching students at Bridge, at, um, in Bridgeport, students in Bridgeport, 
you know, uh, people from all over the world. She taught African art and culture in the school. So she brought an international perspective, you know, before this, the notion of, you know, um, uh, you know, of having a broad intercultural communication. That was something that she believed in and instituted in the public schools. The difficulties, of course, was always money and financing as an artist. Um, and she uh, developed a voice to be able to be a critic of the arts in terms of, uh, it, it, and wrote into the school, wrote into the newspapers. She had lectures and presentations in the schools. She was more than just the dance teacher and entrepreneur. Um, and as you can see in the film, she was also a feminist before the word was even out there for her. Uh, you know, when Ola Tunji was the greatest drummer of all time in Africa, right? And they knew him from where Angela learned how to dance. She, they came to the school to teach the boys drumming. Well, first of all, she said, if the boys wanted to drum, they had to take ballet. That was a requirement. Mm. And he, he, and when the girls wanted to play on the drums, he said, oh, no, 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 the girls can't play the drums. And Angela says, the girls can't pay the drums? The girls can't pay the drums? That's wrong. Everybody who can do what they can do. You you can't teach her anymore. Yeah, that was that was an amazing uh, part of the film. I it really showed um, how she really broke down barriers um, and created a lot of opportunity. Um, and I, it, to me, it came it came off as that approach it really guided her activism. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, her activism started with her mom. Really, you know, when, when uh, it's like in the film, you know, when her mom came to her kindergarten class and stood in front of this white teacher mm. and said, you're not going to, and, and she, she told me the story, she, she remembers sitting in the back and she's watched, watch, you know, watch her mother come into the class because she was, she was a scrub lady. I mean, she really washed people's floors. She took off. She was raising six kids. She came off, she came in and stood at the front of the class and talked to the white teacher and was pointing the finger at the teacher, pointing the finger at the book, pointing the finger at Angela. They're not going to teach a little black sambo to my child. Mm. Okay. Five years old. So, you know, she she had a social consciousness and an international perspective because her mom also supported Marcus Garvey and the, the Back to Africa movement, as well as Israel. You know, I mean, in other words, she told Angela when she was a teenager, she should go to a church, you should go to a temple, you decide for yourself what you believe in. And she became an atheist, of course, but a, the, probably the best, the best spiritualist, I mean, you know, a religious person that you could find because she, she believed in teaching each person, giving to a person and, and kindness, but not letting people get away with bullshit. And mm -hmm. that, was, that was what was so beautiful about her. And you see that, you see that development, you know, and that armor, in terms of believing in herself all the way through the film because when she's rejected and she is and she's been rejected on the blacks you know as a as a black ballerina in broadway mm -hmm. um in a white academy you know where, where she's brilliant but a little too brilliant mm -hmm. a little too liked a little well too known you see i wanted to know how did she get to be so the way she was and that's what the film is about because I think every person, no matter who you are, needs that kind of self-love, um, but not for yourself alone. And that's her message. And I don't. And I think that's why it's timeless. Even though the film was made a while ago, it was not her her words. The words that she spoke and the words that she wrote and the words that she said are just now being heard. You know, they're just they're just now just now being heard. Yeah. 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 You know, as, as an one more thing, as an activist, she joined um, the National Coalition for Black Lesbians and Gays. And at the time, it was Audre Lorde and Barbara Smith who told her that she needed to get onto this committee because they didn't have enough voices for lesbians because it was called the National Coalition for Black Gays. All right, that was the first, it was always black men. So mm -hmm. she was just getting started in her activism, but she joined it and eventually became the co-chair. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, of the black, and, and which gave her a, not only a national but an international platform, and that's when she also traveled uh, internationally. So she had a very broad concept of 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 of, of uh, uh, you know, without the names at this point. Like one of her students at Cal State Long Beach, Benny Lamaster. I'm going to say that for a second. Um, he is, you know, he's a queer scholar. You know, he's a trans activist. 
Yeah, she, she certainly was, inspired a lot of people. He was Angela's protege. He was one of Angela's proteges. You understand what I'm saying? Before things have happened, she was a pioneer. And I, I will say this, that what I'm, what I'm exciting about what I'm doing these days is that I'm working on the archives for Angela that's going to go to Spelman College and also is going to be going to the uh, Jerome Robbins School, uh, Jerome, Libra Jerome Robbins Library at the New York Public Library, which is the largest black dance library in the world. And we're working on a special journal, online journal called the, uh, the Journal of International Women's Studies that's gonna to be totally devoted to her work. And at the end of August, that is going to be released for scholars online, including her dissertation on Audre Lorde. So that the point is that having the fem film in this festival today, at June 4th, when I'm on the cusp of making her material available, her story available, her papers available, um, her written work, the, the level of going from dance to activist, to organizer, to scholar, to international speaker, is it, there's only so much you can do in 20 minutes or mm -hmm. even in, in, you know, in 45 or 50 minutes. So I'm glad to be here. And I'm gonna introduce Shadra Pittman right now because sure. I've kind of led up to the, the next important thing. And uh, I, met, I met Shadra at uh, Zami Nobla and, and Shadra interviewed me for their film festival. Um, mm -hmm. and they should my Audrey film and Angela's film. And we've become close friends, which I'm so glad about. And she's helped me with this wonderful dream that I've always had. I never knew how to do it. So Shadra is gonna speak. Beautiful say, Shadra. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Abbott. Um, it's so great to be here with you both, you, oh, you three. Um, and I really look forward to seeing your film um, free to be. I'm just excited about it. I'm a New Yorker, so I know the ballroom scene very well. <laughs> um, but, you know, I'm, I'm excited about, you know, you hear Dr. Abbott speak about this film and, you know, it's called The Passionate Pursuits of Angela Bone. And part of the reason why when I interviewed her, part of what struck me really about the film was that it was a love story, mm -hmm. like a sincere love story of Dr. Abbott, for her partner, this 37 year relationship. But beyond that, her love for the, the love that she poured into the community, into the children, into the people, into the arts. Um, and so I'm excited because, um, you know, we were talking actually in one of the interviews and she said, you know, I really wanna do something for Dr. Bowen. And I said, what do you wanna do? And she said, you know, I'd really like to do something to honor her, to really, um, solidify who she was in Connecticut. And so, you know, Nina Simone, whom I love, says that there's no excuse for young people, and I would say even older people, um, there's no excuse that we don't know who the heroines are or the heroes are in our community. And I think Dr. Angela Bowen is one of those. Um, and I think as her papers go to Spelman and as her work is at the New York Public Library and people learn about her and learn about this feminist that was like, you know, one of the things that one of you said, um, I think, honey, you um, you asked something about the way she forged, she brought people together. I think you said something about that. And um, from the film, one of her quotes is that, my battle is to forge alliances between people. So she brought people together. She had children who were not only black children, but white children. She brought men and women together. Um, and she challenged Olatunji. So that for me, let me know that she was powerful because he, if you know anything about the African drumming community and cultural community, um, you do not speak back to Olatunji. <laughs> He's the master drummer. Mm -hmm. So for her to say no, the women also, you know, the girls also have to drum and the boys have to do ballet. I knew that this was someone that I <laughs> needed to know. So we have come together um, in 2021 to launch the Bowen Peters Legacy Project. And so it acknowledges the contributions of Dr. Angela Bowen and her uh, then husband, Ken Peters, in the creation of the Bowen Peters Dance School. And it served as a cultural repository, um, training the youth to dance, drum, and dream, really, from 1963 to 1982 in New Haven, Connecticut. She was affectionately known as the cultural maven of New Haven. Um, Dr. Bowman brought African dance, 
uh, and Black culture to New Haven, um, including the traditions of ballet, tap, jazz, and contemporary dance, influencing untold numbers of youth who, as Dr. Abbott said, who have gone on to become judges, who are teaching um, you know, at Alvin Ailey Dance School. So to learn more information about her amazing project and the other films that Dr. Abbott is doing, you can uh, log on to her website, um, www.jenniferabbott.com um, to find out more and you know, watch us as we move forward with, with honoring them and really letting New Haven know that you know, this is a person that did a lot in that community and she needs to be recognized. Absolutely. Yeah. Are there any other um, local organizations um, that are working towards social justice or that are doing some of the things um, in Connecticut or anywhere um, that you want to let our audience know about? Well, I live, I live in Long Beach, California, so I can't, I, <laughs> that's not going to help me now. And get some, <laughs> but Shader, you want to say something or? Uh, yeah, well, I mean, I think, you know, if there are any organizations that would be interested in maybe learning more about the, the Legacy Project, um, you know, Dr. Bowen was involved with a lot of the cultural um, dance communities. Um, you know, she did lectures at Yale. I mean, she was very well versed, not only in the cultural scene, but also uh, academia. So, um, and her work was about social justice. I mean, I think it's quite wonderful um, that we are gathering today on the first day of Pride. Right. Yeah, happy um, Pride. I know it's just it's young and fuzzy for it. I wore all my colors for you guys. Um, but I think it's great. Oh, yeah. that, you know, I wore mine too. See. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> that, we're, <laughs> that we're meeting, you know, on this day. And so um, you know, this work, this this film is about social justice, um, even before social justice had a name. Um, so yeah, contact, you know, Dr. Uh, Abbott's uh, website. And you can put in your information there to get in contact with her and then see the other films that she's done as well um, about women. Great. Thank you, everyone. Um, it's been great uh, chatting with you all. And so just want to say thanks. And uh, I hope to look at your other films and hopefully we can show something else at our festivals in the future. Oh, that would be wonderful. That would be awesome. Thank you, Eugenia. You're just getting started. And uh, I hope to see great things from you. Uh, in the future, so and and look back at mine because they I were am so <laughs> excited. I, first of all, I went to performing arts school. I I was introduced into the arts as a dancer. Um, Me too. And yeah, and so I I was the only person that they cheered for to make it on the African dance ensemble, but I didn't make. It. I didn't have the rhythm for it, so I was straight in battle. <laughs> But I know everything that you guys are talking about, I yeah. just know, I, I remember now I'm like, okay, these are all of the people that my teachers would literally, we had dance history. I had, we were, we were literally being beat these things down. And it's, I just, with someone, you know, I, I'm just this, I'm so excited. I'm definitely going to be reaching out anyway. I've been, I've been writing a story about dancers anyway. And I'm just so this is so, I'm so excited to check it out. I think this is beautiful. I think when you said that this is a love story, it I is. was literally thinking, I was like, this is this is like someone's love of each other. <laughs> Did you say it that? It really like, is. It really it's is. so beautiful. This I mean, beautiful. yeah. I was trying not to cry. Yeah. So we act like I'm not, I'm not <laughs> it's inspiring though. Yeah, no, but it's inspiring. I mean, their story is inspiring. I mean, I, I had to watch it. I probably watched it five times um, because I just couldn't get enough. I wanted more <laughs> of the story. So, uh, I'm so excited. Glad we were able to make connections with them. To here with awesome. you guys. Yeah. Right. Well, we're going to be connected. Absolutely. I'm <laughs> excited about. Are you in Los Angeles? Uh, I'm in LA. I'm in Long Beach. I go to Long Beach all the time. My well, aunt. Well, when you come, make sure you come and we let's let's. Yes, please. Come, yeah. come, come and look at the archives here. It's amazing, and this house is a whole damn archive. I'm like, <laughs> I'm <so excited. laughs> it's like oh I my god! I visit my aunt a lot. Her and her partner are there all the time, and I just go and I just hang out with all the dogs and the animals and. Cats. 
<laughs> so I'm like, okay, what's not? So yeah, for sure. All right, everyone. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank thank you, thank you ladies, so much. Thank you so thank much. You, great yeah. party and a great festival. Thank you. Yeah, I'm so good luck. luck.